morning church and I want to welcome all of us. Um, if you're joining us from Facebook, please leave your, uh, you know, say hi on the, on the message so we can, we can get back to you and know that you're there as well. Uh, that will be, that'll be great. And today we are continuing on our series on the book of Job. So just a little bit of recap before we get on to chapter 12 on the book of Job. I would want to I want to encourage all of us as well to open up your Bible. If you there, there are a few verse uh, scripture reading, and it will be great if you can have Bible before you, and just don't take my word for it, and open the word yourself and and see for yourself uh, the word of God. So a bit of recap. So as of last week, all of Job's friends, all three of Job's friends, have spoken, and the last one was Joe Far last week. And we know Jophar has good theology and we learned from it yet last week. Yet, it's, while it's good theology, it's not applicable to Job. Um, while it's not applicable to Job, we, we conclude that we can benefit from it still. And that's what we did last week. So today we look at ch- chapter 12 of Job, which is the beginning of Job's response. And Job's response will last three uh, to chapter 15 in, in the next three verses, uh, three chapters of Job. We're going to look at just Job, Job chapter 12 today. So that's what we're going to look at. Um, this is so far the longest response okay, from Job. There are three chapters, so we have to split it out into multiple sermons. And they're so rich. Just a bit of warning. It's, you know, I try to probably speak as fast as I can so that it's not uh, has not, the, the sermon does not become too long for all of us. So today from chapter 12, we're going to look at how we can put our confidence in God, regardless of circumstances, um, regardless of whether or not we could make sense of all circumstances, what we are going through. How can we, as children of God, put our confidence in God and not in anything else? And we're going to look at that in three ways, how we can do this, how we can understand, how we can put our confidence in God alone. The first thing we're going to look at is how we view of God, how we view God. And secondly, how we accept God's wisdom. And finally, how we understand God's sovereignty. Okay, let me say that again. How we view God, how we accept God's wisdom, and how we understand God's sovereignty in three ways. The first one, how we view God. Well, most of us does not um, does not require much convincing on the importance of perspective, or view, right? How we view God on a perspective. Per- perspective could either make your life a fulfilling one, or a miserable one. Some people think wealth can make you happy, but not really. It's perspective on life that will either make your life a fulfilling one, a happy one, or a miserable one. Uh, Consider this story told by um, uh, a professor of psychology from the University of Pennsylvania named Angela Duckworth. In in her book, Greed, uh, she she tells a story about three bricklayers working together side by side in the hot summer day. And a young child was passing by, a young boy passing by on on his way home from school. And he stops and and look look at the bricklayers. And he asked the first, what are you doing, sir? He asked. The first brick layer replies, Well, I'm laying bricks. Okay. And he passed on to the next brick layer and asked the second brick layer, say, What are you doing, sir? And the second brick layer say, Well, I'm feeding my family. As he stacked the bricks. And then, okay. And then he passed on, uh, the boy passed to the next brick layer and asked, How about you, sir? What are you doing? And the third brick layer say, I'm building a cathedral, um, a house for God. Perspective. Three brick layers doing the same thing have three different answers. And no doubt what we can say is the first brick layer who say he's laying brick has a job. He has a job. The second brick layer who say he's feeding his family has a career. While the last brick layer who say he's building the house of God not only that he has a job, not only that he has a career, he has a calling in his life. Perspective. And 
the importance of perspective for these, these, these three different brick layers is this. When hardship comes their way, the first one will flee immediately. The second brick layer, whose work, who see his brick laying job as a career to feed his family, perhaps he will stick around a bit longer when hardship hits. The third, the third brick layer will stay put regardless of what comes his way, however hard it is for him, because he understands this is his calling for his life. So this is talking about perspective or view, um, talking about how our view will help us to persevere in this life. So in life, perspective is important, but perspective of God is ultimate. How we view our life is important. Yes, we all know that. Yet our view of God, our perspective of God is ultimate. Job opens his response with a sarcastic comment. You may not realize that uh, when, when we first read it earlier on, but have a look at it again. Job 12 verse 1. Then Job answered and said, No doubt you are the people and wisdom will die with you. You see, that's, that's sarcastic comment from Job, taking a, a, a jab at, at his friend. Job basically says this, You are the man. You're the man, and you have the wisdom. And he say, but yet, your wisdom will die with you. Job's friends are proud of their wisdom, you see. They put their confidence in their wisdom and understanding. We, we, we look at this for the last eight, or you know, last seven or eight um, sermons on, on Job's friends' comments, and we can see they take pride, they take confidence in their wisdom and understanding. And Job say, you will die with your wisdom. They are so sure um, that their understanding and wisdom about God is so accurate. They, they apply this to Job. They believe that good things happen to good people. And the fact that Job is suffering, they conclude that Job must be sinning against God. And in order for Job to be restored, Job must repent. But you and I know, we read chapter 1 and chapter 2, that Job does not sin. In fact, Job sinned because of his righteousness, not because of his sin. So for Jophar and also for Eliphaz and Bildad, their, their view of God is very shallow. Not totally wrong, but shallow. Their view of God is shallow. Their view of their wisdom and knowledge is high. Uh, quite the opposite of how they view God. And they view God someone, at, they view God, God as someone who's, uh, who can be full, fully analyzed and fully understood and predictable. So that, that's what Job's friend believed. God is fully predictable. God is like a marionette. If you know a marionette, it's a, it's a puppet that, uh, whose different parts you can move with strings. So that's how they believe God, uh, that they can make God do whatever they want if if, they, if we just know the right string to pull. And their view of God is shallow when their view of their own wisdom is too high. So, in other words, we can say that Job's friends put their confidence in their wisdom instead of in God. Because they, they put confidence in their wisdom and they see God as, you know, a predictable God. Uh, if you pull the right string, God will move the right way as, as, as the uh, puppet master can do. So Job, Job finds his friend's view of God is too limited. And he says this in verse 6, uh, Job 12 verse 6. The tent of robbers are at peace and those who provoke God are secure. Who brings their God in their hand to prove his friend's error. Job says, good things happen to bad people. Remember Job's friends believe in, in their wisdom that good things happen to good people? And because Job is suffering, that means Job is sinning. Job's now tried to tell them in verse 6 here that good things happen to bad people. Your view of God is not right. So how we view God is ultimate. It's, 
it's not just important, it's ultimate. Uh, if we are to put our confidence in Him, if we are to be able to put our confidence in God, even in the midst of suffering and hardship, then, um, we, we, must underst- then, then we must understand the purpose of why God's doing this and how we view God is very important. And um, we can do so when we understand that hardship and suffering are not designed to put us to death, but to put to death our sinful desires. Suffering that comes Job's way are not designed to put Job to death. And we know that because Job is not sinning and God did not intend to kill Job. Job didn't know this, of course, but we know. In chapter 2, uh, God says to Satan, Do whatever you want to Job, uh, just don't kill Job. So suffering that comes our way are designed by God not to put us to death, but to put to death our sinful desires. Um, let, let's look at Proverbs 17, verse 3. Proverbs 17, verse 3. The crucible is for silver, and the furnace is for gold, and the Lord tests hearts. What is he saying here? Well, just as the furnace, you know, the fiery furnace is used to get rid of the infirmities in gold, to purify gold, not to destroy the gold, but to make it pure so that the the gold can come up pure. Suffering is designed by God as a furnace to purify us, not to destroy us, not to put us to death, but to purify us. And that's what, what the proverb is saying to us. Another, another verse from, from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6. Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, verse 43 to 45. Let me read. For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, and are grapes picked from a bramble bush? The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. And the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. What is he saying here? So this is Jesus uh, trying to illustrate um, the, the sinful desires deep down in our life. When we get impatient, let me, let me explain this. When we get impatient with anything, with, with our spouse, with our children, with our parents, uh, with authority, when we get impatient and perhaps we get angry, um, it is often because we, we, are, we, we are denied of the thing we desire, or the, of the thing that we treasure, of the thing that we put confidence in. So, Try to recall the last time uh, you were angry. And the Bible explains to us, we were angry, we get impatient because the thing that we put confidence in, that we treasure, that we love, that we desire, were denied. That's why we get angry. And, and that's what Jesus says in the parable. Our, our impatience or, or anger or selfishness or greed or pride They're all merely the fruit, just like a tree that bears fruit. They're merely the fruit. You, you can try, we we can try to kill the fruit, okay? Uh, Because we don't like the fruit. We don't like to get angry. We can, we can try to kill the fruit, but sooner or later, the tree will bear the same fruit again. If you don't fix the tree, we don't fix the heart. If we get angry, we, we, we are prideful. We, you know, we, we speak carelessly. If, if we, we, we don't like it, you know, as Christian, we are told to stop it, right? And we don't like it. And then we, we try to kill the fruit, the bad fruit. But sooner or later, the, the tree will bear the same fruit again. Or being a Christian, if you've been Christian long enough, we, we try to put on a, a good face. Um, among churches, in churches, we, we say to ourselves, uh, to, in order to look good to our, our pastor or our, our leaders or our or colleagues, or, you know, in order to look good, we're Christians, we, we put on fake fruit. We put on, you know, we, let, let's say you are a apple tree, 
and then you say, ah, oh, you know, no one likes apple, orange is good. And then you try to stuck on oranges on, on your apple tree. You know what happened? That fruit will rot. Or if it, if, if, if it doesn't rot, if it doesn't last long enough, when, when the wind of hardship comes, when the wind of suffering hits your tree, hits the tree, what happened? The fruits will fall. Because they're fake. They don't belong there. That's what happened. That's what Jesus told us in Luke 6. So our suffering, our hardship, they are, they are God's furnace. That's God, God's fiery furnace to purify us, to purify our heart, to put to death our sinful desires. Until, as in Luke 6, it says this, until the good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. Treasure is talking about confidence. What you treasure is what you put confidence in to purify us. Maybe some of us this morning listening, thinking, well, I'm not that bad. Uh, there's not much to purify. Um, I think we're not... You know, if you compare yourself to a, a murderer, a rapist, a, a raper, a, a, a criminal, um, you would think, well, I'm a good person. Uh, but the truth is, good or bad, when it comes to morality, it's not, it's not as black and white. It's not either you're good or you're bad. It's, it's more a scale. It's a spectrum. It has been said, if, if we all can... can dive into someone's thought and mind. If you know my mind, if I know your mind, if your wife know your mind and your wife know your mind and if husband know wife's, the, his wife's mind or children know their parents' mind, if everyone knows each other's mind, then we would hate each other. Because we would, our thoughts are not always pure. We don't always think the best of a person. Husband and wife, if your spouse can listen to every thoughts on your mind, your marriage won't last. All of us need purifying. All of us need purifying. And that's what God is saying. How do you view God? Do you trust God because you do you trust God? Do you put confidence in Him because you understand God completely? Is that the reason you put your trust in God? Or you can trust God this morning precisely because you could not fully understand his ways which one are you are you the one who says i trust god because i understand god i i, I fully understand i work god out or you put your trust in god put your confidence in god knowing that god's wisdom is unfathomable they say i can't understand all his ways sometimes it doesn't make sense but i put my trust in him regardless. I put my confidence in Him. I treasure in Him regardless. And this leads us to our second point this morning. How we accept God's wisdom. If you don't want to get frustrated and disappointed with God in our life, then we must accept there are two types of God's wisdom. There are two types. The first type is wisdom that God shares with all His creation. They are open for all to know and understand and learn. Yet there is a second part of wisdom, God wisdom, that He keeps within Himself, that He keeps hidden within Himself, that He did not share with all creations. And let us look at Job 12, verse 7 onwards. Job 12, verse 7 to 10. But ask the beasts, and they will teach you, the birds of the heavens, and they will tell you, or the bushes of the earth, and they will teach you, and the fish of the sea will declare to you. Who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? In His hand is the life of every living thing, and the breath of all mankind. Job says, even the creations understand the wisdom of God better than Job's friends. That's what Job's saying to his friends. The bees, the birds, and the fish, and the bushes, they all know that the hand of God, the hand of the Lord has done this. It's not special. So that's what Job tried to take a, take a, take a, a jab at um, his friends. Your wisdom, they're, they're not special. Even the animals, 
The bushes know about this truth, this wisdom that God revealed to all. So Job's friends have limited wisdom. That's what Job is uh, saying to them. And even the birds and fish know. Uh, A.W. A. Tozer writes in, in, in his book, In the Pursuit of God. Let me quote A.W. Tozer. Quote, God dwells in his creation and is everywhere indivisibly present in all his works. We can see God's handiwork in the creation. That's the wisdom that God reveals to all. And C.S. Lewis similarly uh, writes this quote, We may ignore, but we can nowhere evade the presence of God. The world is crowded with Him. He walks everywhere incognito. God reveals Himself in everything and anything in our lives. Whether it's suffering, whether it's creation, God reveals Himself to all, us, to all of us, not just to believers, but to non-believers. So for non-believers, for those who don't believe in God, if you don't believe in God this morning, if you have doubt in God this morning, God is trying to speak to you as well this morning. Say like, just look around you. My fingerprints are everywhere. God wants us to draw near to Him this morning. And if you don't believe in the Lord Jesus this morning, He wants to draw you to Him as well. Some of us has been ignoring God. Uh, whether we did, whether we intentionally do that or unintentionally, but some of us has been ignoring God. Some people don't believe uh, because they refuse to investigate, to look around, look at the nature, and and investigate the truth, the claim of God. They don't believe because they don't do their homework. They dismiss God for fearing of finding God. There are people like that. Perhaps some of you listening this morning are like that. You, you dismiss God for fearing of finding God. Or, or if you, when you found God, you, you believe that you know, your life's going to be harder. Your life's going to be difficult. Because you love your life right now. You love your comfortable life right now. And you fear if you follow God, if you found God, your life's going to be hard and difficult. See, let me just encourage you, if that's you this morning, let me just encourage you. Just because you ignore something to be real, it doesn't mean it can disappear just like that because you refuse to believe it. There are people who think if they just ignore it, it's not there. Let me encourage you. Just because you try to do that, it doesn't mean that God is not there and God is not pursuing you this morning. Well, for others, if uh, those who believe in the Lord this morning, if you believe in Jesus, in God, your sa as God, your Savior, um, many good people, I want to remind us in this point, that many good people have drifted away from faith, not because of suffering, not because of hardship, they've drifted away from God, but precisely the opposite, because of comfort in their life. Because life has been good and has been easy, and they're drifting away from faith. There are not many things in this life that are more dangerous to our faith in the Lord than our comfortable life. In this day and age, it's not hard for Satan to lure us away from God, from loving God. He just really, for Satan to do that, he just need to make us busy. He just need to give us good job. He just need to get a lovely family. He just need to give us, make us wealthy. Satan just need to make us comfortable in life. And we'll be lured away and drift away slowly without knowing from God. Satan like to lure us away, not to a lot of times for in this day and age, not through suffering or hardship, but through comfortable life, through wealth, through good career, through good family. So let me just remind us that we don't go from loving God one day 
to hating God, despising God the next day. It doesn't work that way. How the process is so slow and so subtle, we don't realize it. It happens so slowly. It's like being asleep in a boat in a calm river. You were asleep in a calm river. You don't know. After a few hours, you wake up. You're so far away from the shore. And that's how it is that we can drift away from God because we're sleeping. We get too comfortable with life. Our job is too good. Our family is lovely. We are fine. We love our life. Slowly we drift away from our love for God. Now let me say this. Oftentimes we, don't, we will not realize that we're drifting away until we are too far from God. But yet it is a reminder and it's God's grace that we don't turn from loving God one day to hating and despising our faith the next day. We can still turn back. We can still wake up. During this pandemic, let, let me remind ourselves to, um, about this truth, this very important truth, to not harden our hearts. If you're not during this pandemic, during this lockdown, if, if your love for Christ is not deepened, if, if your prayer life, if your spiritual discipline is not heightened, if, if you're not more desperate for God, then you are not walking closer to Him. If you're not walking closer to Him, then you're walking away from Him. See, this is the thing when it comes to relationship with God. No one stay put on one place. You cannot say, well, I'm not growing closer to God or deeper in love with God. But at the same time, I'm, I'm, I'm not growing cold towards God. That is, that is just false. That is just Satan's lie. No one can stay put. No one, it's just like no one can stay put sleeping in a boat, not moving, unless you are anchored down. If you're not moving closer to God this time, you are moving away from Him. Our third point, how we understand God's sovereignty. This will help us as well put our confidence in God. How we understand God's sovereignty. So if we are to be able to put our confidence in God, to have treasure in God in the midst of deep suffering or in the midst of comfort, of good life, good career, then we, we, we must understand this truth about the sovereignty of God that Job explained in the last part of this chapter 12. The bulk of it. Uh, Job 12 verse 12 says this. Wisdom is with the aged and understanding in length of days. So both Job and his friends agree on the importance of wisdom. Right? And Job says wisdom is with the aged. Understanding is in the length of days. But only Job though seems to understand and to realize the limitations of human wisdom. Humans have certain lengths in this, right? And Job highlight to his friends here that wisdom is with the aged and understanding in length of days. He's saying this to highlight that their wisdom, human wisdom, is limited. Job says in, in um, let me just quickly go through this, from verse 14 to 25 to 24, till the end really, and how Job tried to show the wisdom of God, the sovereignty of God, that is far beyond human understanding and human wisdom. In verse 14, he said, God tears down, God shuts man. In verse 15, he said, God withholds the water, yet also he's the one who sends them out. And verse 17, God promotes and strips away counselors and judges. It is God who does that. And verse 18, God installs and removes kings. Verse 19, God leads priests away, stripped. The mighty God overthrows. In verse 20, God deprives speech from trusted people. He takes away discernments from the elders or the wise. Verse 21, God controls the fate of princess or, or, or princes the, or, or the powerful rulers. 
God controls them, controls their fate. Verse, verse 22, God brings darkness to light. Who can do that? Only God can do that. Verse 23, God makes nation great and he also destroyed them. Nation rise and collapse at the hands of God. Verse 24, God makes the leaders wanderers in a pathless waste. Job says, God is sovereign. God does all that, my friends. And in verse 25, he says, they grow up, these people, they grow up in darkness, in dark without light. And he makes them stagger like a drunken man. My brothers and my sisters, God is sovereign over all. And that's what Job is saying. God is sovereign over all. Even as we know when we read chapter 1 and chapter 2 of Job, God is sovereign even over Satan. Even Satan, God's agency, God used Satan as his tool to inflict suffering and hardship on Job and perhaps on you today. Even Satan, God is sovereign over them. He controls absolutely everything, everything. There's not a single thing that happens in your life that is beyond God's control, nothing. And Job's last verse is important reminder for all, for all of us that all great people without God, they're walking in the dark. They walk around like a drunken man. Without God wisdom, without God, without understanding the sovereignty of God, you may be successful. You may have a lovely and comfortable life. But Job is saying, you are like a drunken man walking in the dark. You don't know where you're going. You're just going around in circle without realizing it. Where are you heading in life? Before we judge though, these friends of Job, before we, you know, judge harshly on Job's friends, let us be reminded uh, that sometimes we are like Job's friends, aren't we? When we complain um, to God what we get in life, the hardship and the unfairness that we receive in our life, we complain to God. We say, God, this is not fair. Um, we think that we know what's best for us and God doesn't. And we complain to God. Tim Keller says this, and I quote, God will give us what we have asked for in prayer if we knew everything God knows. God will give us what we have asked for in prayer if we knew everything He knows. So God will give us what is good for us. Everything that is good for us, God will give us. But, it may not necessarily mean that we are going to like what He gives us because we don't know what God knows. Our wisdom is limited. There are part of wisdom of God that is hidden, that God keeps for Himself. So Job's friend treasure or put confidence in their wisdom. They put their hope in their knowledge and understanding. And Job warns his friend. Job wants his friend that they will die with their treasure. That's in the beginning, on, in, in the verse, in verse 2. No doubt you are the people and wisdom will die with you, Job says. It's a warning. Whatever confidence that you have in your life, whatever treasure that you put, that you love in your life, they will die with you if your confidence is not in God, if your treasure is not in the Lord. Whatever it is. You may have confidence in your career. You may have confidence in your family. You may have confidence in your knowledge, in your job, in your parents, in your children. Whatever confidence that you have in, they will die with you if your confidence is not rooted in God. And that's Job's warning for his friends. Your confidence, your treasure, your wisdom will die with you. How about you? What do you treasure in your life? What do you put your confidence in today? Charles Studd, a British missionary, 17th century, wisely writes this, and I quote, Only one life, it will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. 
Now, it would be unreasonable for me or for the Bible or for anyone really to ask to put to ask any of us to put our confidence in God, especially those of us, those of you who are perhaps suffering deeply right now, going through hardship right now. It would be unreasonable to ask you to put your confidence in God because you are hurting right now. But it's only unreasonable if God himself hasn't been through what they are going through, what you are going through. For someone who has not gone through the hardship that you've gone through right now, it will be unreasonable. But I'm not asking you that. The Bible, God himself asked you that. And God himself has gone through perhaps even worse than what we may have gone through in our life. Remember the fiery furnace that purified gold early on in the sermon? Well, who are we kidding? Um, we, we are no gold. Uh, if you, if we are honest with ourselves, when we, you know, when when you let someone into your thoughts, um, can f- see everything you're thinking and your the darkest part of your heart. We are no gold. Who are we kidding? We are barely silver, per- perhaps bronze, maybe even not bronze, uh, let alone gold. Um, if we're bro- being, see, the thing is, if we are not gold and we're being thrown into the fire, what will happen? If you're just wood, what happened? We'll burn up. We'll not be purified. We'll be burned up uh, in the fiery furnace. We'll be burned to ashes. Our sins will ensure us if we're being thrown into uh, the fiery furnace, we will burn. Our sins will ensure that we will burn. The reason that God this morning can confidently say to you and me that we will not be burned to ashes in this suffering, in this fiery furnace of suffering and hardship is because God himself has been there for us. That's the only reason. Um, let, let me share a famous story. If you've been around Christianity, been church around, you know this story. So during the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, in the, the king of Babylon, there were three Jewish men. Uh, whose name, even children would remember this uh, if you grew up in church, His, their names are Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So the Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, erected a golden image and asked everyone to bow down and worship. These three Jewish men refused. And because of their refusal, they will be punished. They will be thrown into fiery furnace. Let, let me read to you from Daniel 3. The book of Daniel, chapter 3, verse 15 to 23. It's a bit long, so I'm going to read to you. Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I've made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods and worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury and the expression of his face was changed against Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. And he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks and their tunics, their hats, and their other garments. And they were thrown in the burning fiery furnace because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated. The flame of the fire killed those men who took up Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These three men, Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning fiery furnace. And notice this, what these three men say, okay, in, in verse 17 and 18. 
Not only they refuse to bow down because and because of it, they would be burned in fire furnace. They also say this, God will deliver us. And then in 18, he say, but even if he not, even if, it, if God does not deliver us from this fiery furnace, we will not bow down to you. See, these three men understand who God is, the sovereignty of God. And then, and then let me continue on in verse 24 and 25, Daniel 3. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and arose up in haste. He declared to his counselor, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king, he answered and said, But I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of God. God sent Jesus to take our place in that fiery furnace, just like God sent his son Jesus to be with Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Jesus was burned on the cross because of our sins. So if you're suffering today, to be, confid to be confident that, to know that your suffering, whatever you're suffering, is not retribution for your sins. It's not a payment for your sins because God has paid that on the cross in full. So to the degree that you see God did that for you in His Son Jesus in that fiery furnace, we can then put our confidence, our complete confidence in God alone, regardless of our circumstances. Let us pray.